work for Stencilla, and um, I'm happy to welcome you for the uh, a session on uh, the uh, tool that, presenting the tool that we recently have been um, developing. Most of the work has been done by Nokomi Bentley, who is here as well, and he's going to be helping out. The session will be hopefully hands-on with you uh, trying out the tool as well. So Nakami is here as, uh, first of all, the original developer of the tool, but also somebody who can definitely help if there's, there's some small uh, glitches coming up. Um, we call the session Building Rep uh, Reproducible Computer Environments a workshop for non-experts, and that's what our tool um, actually um, is, is addressing. So it's addressing the problems that uh, many non-experts, in particular in our case researchers, because that's our main target audience, are having when they're trying to uh, reproduce um, computational work. Uh, now I said that uh, we're going to be working mainly hands-on um, and so if uh, you would like to try out the tool with us, uh, we have uh, some links here for you. So yes, if you want to do the full work, the full uh, uh, try the, the tool in full, you need to have Docker. So the tool that we build called Docker sits on the top of Docker. You will need Docker for that. That is probably a longer uh, download if you need that. Um, and if you only have Docker, uh, get our tool called Docker. And this tiny URL, which I'm going to write down here as well, should take you to uh, the installation instructions. We have installation instructions for um, three major operating systems, obviously for Linux. This is Linux conference, but there are also installation instructions for Windows if you use a Windows machine. And also we have a lot of users that use Windows as well as Mac. So I'll just write this down, this tiny URL. So once I move the slides, move on with the slides, you still will be able to access it. So it's Dr. Info. Slash. And this takes you straight into the installation instructions install. And um, we also put some test files, so we're going to be showing, we're going to be working with two examples. One example with R uh, programming language, one another example with Python. Very simple examples if you want to get them so that you could work together with us. Also another tiny URL that takes you, that should come up immediately with a small zip file uh, to be downloaded. and then Docker tutor Doctor Tutorial. And finally, the main website for Doctor um, is under this third tiny URL link, but if you Google actually, right now Google already indexes this website that we have Doctor, it comes up, the first result is uh, our, uh, our tool. So just to give you a little bit more background, I did mention who are our main audience. I want to explain why we decided to build a tool on the top of Docker. You think, okay, why, why work on the top of Docker? Docker is already such a useful tool. Lots of people use it. Um, you know, what's, what's wrong about it? There's nothing wrong about Docker itself, but it is an extra step that users who are typically not um, um, developers uh, have to learn. Um, so the base of science, if you, if you haven't worked much with researchers within science um, environment, the core principle of science is reproducibility. You should be able to whatever the study is, however the study is done, you should be able as, a, as another researcher to reproduce that study. Otherwise, how can you trust the results? And now there's a major crisis nowadays because uh, a lot of research is done using computational methods, and um, there's a proliferation of tools, there's the dependency hell, um, and it's actually not that easy to reproduce a lot of computational studies. It's a problem that many researchers, many domains in research face, and um, it comes from the fact that 
as I said, proliferation of, of tools, lots of versions, people using uh, different methods, lots of people using no practically no software engineering methods, software engineering approaches. So it becomes quite chaotic. And um, the tools that a lot of developers and people who are uh, whose um, software development is an everyday job. A lot of these tools are not that well known to researchers. And also, these tools um, are just another thing that researchers have to learn. So, um, things like containers, uh, which are a solution, one of the solutions to uh, reproducibility, um, they are yet another thing that researchers have to, have to learn and have to become pretty um, proficient with. Um, and for example, Docker, so one of the popular um, container tools, uh, requires a user of a Docker to be able to write a Docker file and maintain the Docker file every time something changes within the project. So if you're adding, uh, changing, removing libraries, removing packages, um, you have to update your Docker file. Now, for an average researcher, that's something on the top of already quite a lot of overheads they have to deal with. And their main goal, their main uh, work is doing research, is not the technology. So you need to, if you're outside of the area of research, you need to understand that the goal for researchers is doing research and their motivation and their reward is within getting the results. The technology is an overhead for researchers. It's a useful overhead, but it's still an overhead. And so we thought, um, how about working with Docker to make it a little bit uh, more user-friendly in terms of these uh, challenges? So learning how to write a Docker file, maintaining that Docker file, can this be automated? And so we created yet another Docker tool in a way. There are tools that already exist uh, and, in a, and that do a similar thing, so they use Docker and work with existing source code uh, to create a reproducible environment, um, a reproducible container. But um, there are some gaps with these tools, and this is what we uh, addressed with our tool with Doctor. Um, so we determine all the package requirements, so each package that uh, is needed to produce the scientific results will have a number of requirements, and these are analyzed and they are included to be available within the container. Um, also, we do look up all the other system dependencies that a package may require. So there are a number of packages, for example, we're gonna have a look at um, uh, uh, an example project that is uh, created in R. There are a number of system dependencies, so system-wide dependencies that need to be available uh, within the container they're not necessarily available within the system if you don't do similar research. Um, and so you have to have them in order to reproduce the results to generate the output. Um, and uh, another thing is that we um, created a tool that allows uh, the user actually rebuilds every time there is a change in um, uh, how whatever packages are added, updated or removed, uh, not the whole image needs to be rebuilt. And that is extremely useful for researchers in terms of saving them time. So a lot of uh, research projects may have dozens, literally dozens of packages. And, and every time you change a package, if it's all squeezed in one layer within a Docker image, the whole image will have to be rebuilt. And that means, you know, that means quite a lot of time. If there was a mistake, that means, oh, you have to fix that mistake, rebuild it again and again. And you do it daily several times if you're a researcher. That's not an uncommon scenario. And, and it's just uh, a, lot of, a lot of time where you have to go and make yourself a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. So in order to deal with that, uh, we uh, created a tool that um, does incremental builds. And we're gonna talk you through this step by step when we're gonna go for a hands-on um, tutorial. Um, now, another thing is that this is a tool that helps the users, but does not completely leave them, you know, doesn't create a black box. So if you want to learn how to use Docker, 
but you don't quite know, or you don't want to start with tutorials. You're a researcher who has a little bit of knowledge around it, and you just, you know, you just want to get the practical knowledge, how to build Docker files, how to write Docker files, and maintain them. Um, and also, you will see that Docker, apart from creating a Docker file, creates some other useful files um, that are a part of the standard for writing projects in R or Python. Um, so what uh, Docker does is allows you to take over at any point in time. Um, so it will create a Docker file that is a basis for building a Docker container, but also you can step in as a user, take the Docker file that was created by the tool, open it, look through it, understand what's going on in there, because we created a tool that puts some useful comments, and from then on, you can start uh, working with the Docker file, so you can start maintaining it yourself, and uh, this way progress also with your knowledge. And if you decide, okay, I actually messed up something here, all you need to do is rerun Docker again, and Docker will create, recreate that Docker file for you, and you can start again, look inside the Docker, Docker file, and, and work with it. So, yes, it can automate a lot of work for you, but it also allows you to look inside and um, take control at any point in time. And finally, this is an optional thing that we're working on uh, to be a part of Doctor. So Stencilla is a much wider project. We don't only focus on that one tool. This is actually a tool that is going to be a part of um, something that we call Stencilla Hub, where um, users using different tools from uh, writing uh, advanced R scripts, Python, using things like Jupyter Notebook, which is very common among researchers, to also using spreadsheets um, and um, often using uh, things for writing reports, things like uh, um, Microsoft Word, so word processors. We're building a place where, uh, we're building a system where uh, they can collaborate together um, and we will also enable them uh, having their projects um, being always packaged in a reproducible container. Um, so Doctor will be underpinning that and um, uh, we allow Doctor, we're going to work working on Doctor to um, support uh, installing Stensla packages, so um, other elements of this Stensla ecosystem. But today we won't be looking at this last bit, but we're going to look at all these uh, four um, features, the first, first four features of um, Doctor. So I said there's going to be a workflow, a, um, a workflow that is hands-on. Um, so I'm going to switch now from the slides, and we're going to move into Oh, doctor. Yeah, not doctor. Yeah. Right. So this. Yeah. I was saying doctor, and I was writing Docker. So I'll try to bring it up. So yeah, if you downloaded a zip file, if you could if you could unzip it. So I have it still zipped because I already have it unzipped in in a, in a quite a big file tree, but if you could unzip that uh, folder uh, directory, you should have two subdirectories there. One it's going to be called R spatial, the other one is going to be called Pi weather. So we're going to start with R spatial. So if you could navigate yourself into the R spatial um, folder, if you have the zipped folder. So it should look, yeah, it should contain these three files. 
inside. And now, also I'm gonna bring up the website with Docker, Doctor, sorry, Doctor. I'm gonna probably be saying this, making this mistake for all the whole workshop. So if you, um, install. So the first URL should take you to these install instructions. And uh, depending on which system you're on, we only have client, uh, we are, sorry, we only have command line interface now for Doctor. So you will need to have um, a terminal running. Um, and yeah, to install Doctor, you just copy the relevant command for, for your system copy paste it in a terminal and that should install Doctor for you. I have it all already installed on my machine, so I'll slowly start walking you through. But as Nakami said, if you got stuck at any point, just raise your hand and I uh, will help you. So what we have here actually, I'm gonna make it larger. I'm using, uh, I'm using a, a tool that allows to build, uh, so I'm not gonna be doing completely live coding just to avoid lots of typos, but I'm using a tool that has kind of a pre-recorded line by line um, uh, walkthrough script. So we will start with the, oops. Okay. We will start with the, um, uh, the R example. So the one which is called R minus spatial, the directory is called R minus spatial. Um, so if you can, I am navigating on in my um, uh, folder into, um, the spatial, our spatial example. And as I showed you before, there should be three, um, two files, and I think Philly free is a subdirectory. If I remember correctly, with some data in particular format. Um, and it's a, just a very simple R example that has, um, that is plotting a small um, plot based on Philly free is a data set, spatial data set, uh, with uh, a record of, I think, some crime statistic for Philadelphia. Um, and the R script uh, contains just a few bits of code, uses some um, libraries that can deal with this uh, type of, uh, with this data format, and uses some other libraries to create the plot. So it's an example, if you're a researcher, um, and you're working in spatial analysis, um, created this file, uh, the um, main R, so uh, R script, where uh, you generate the plot, you have some data, you maybe have some readme file written in R markdown. Now, you would like to make it, put it in a, in a, uh, in a format that is easy to reproduce for anyone. Um, you could just put it out there as is, zip it like we have it zipped and given it to you. Um, but um, actually for a lot of researchers to install all the packages uh, that are in the main R file, that might be quite challenging. So our answer to this is have the, um, uh, have the uh, doctor do it for you. Um, so we have two libraries, RGDale and library called SP. These are libraries that are not available in standard installation of R. So even if you're an R user, and other researchers also try it out, you will try to run this file in your uh, R environment, and that's not gonna work uh, because you don't have these two libraries, and there's actually no uh, command that install these libraries, okay? This, these two libraries, if you're not familiar with R, um, I mean, these two first lines, they just load the library, so you have to have actually installed. And um, in case of RGDale, you will see that uh, getting that library available, it's a little bit more complicated. If you're a researcher, again, I like to imagine that the audience that we're 
uh, looking at here are people that their main goal is doing research is not sitting with uh, uh, figuring out the uh, elements of um, technology that they need. Um, so we will use Dr. Straight on. So we say, okay, I have finished my research. I have this doctor tool that they explained to me, more or less, they created for me. I have Docker. And um, I don't actually know how to use Docker, but Docker should do it all for me. Um, so we type in Docker compile. And you will see that here on the side, it wasn't, it was a little bit quick. Uh, Doctor created free files. So we actually see that we have uh, files starting with a dot, dot description, dot docker file, and dot environment, dot json ld. So let's have a look closer at these files. So they were created by Doctor in the compile step. So dot description is a file that is part of a our standard, part of um, something that um, uh, became part of a uh, uh, standard that became uh, used widely by our programmers, but not everybody's aware of it. And again, this is another thing that requires maintenance. Um, and this file includes information about the packages that are used in um, uh, the uh, R code, the, uh, the main R. Uh, now we have uh, two uh, of these packages, RGDEL and SP. Um, now there is information here, and this is created by Doctor. And now um, if you want to stop Doctor generating this file, you need to rename this file to description without a dot. So next time if I run uh, Doctor, Doctor compile, and this file doesn't have the dot, Doctor would actually look at this file to build the Docker container, to build the image for Docker container, rather than into the code. Now, the second file that Doctor created for me is the environment.jsonld. Uh, so it's a file that is in a format, jsonld format, um, which, okay, let's just put it out there, and maybe actually I'm gonna open it in, a, in here, so that you can have a better look. So this is a JSON-LD format is a structured sort of tree-like format if you're not familiar with JSON. Um, JSON-LD is an extension on JSON and it contains information again about the requirements of the code. So it has um, the names of the software package and um, all the requirements for these packages. So here we have RGDEL, so that was the first one. Now what's uh, important here is that um, this information that is pulled down here came from um, the online um, uh, database for our packages, CRUD database. So what Doctor does is goes online, pulls that information down, into uh, the JSON file about every single package that is included in um, the R code. Obviously, um, that uh, package has to be in the CRAN uh, database. So the same thing is um, uh, here for the package SP. So as you can see, everything that was, so this is for RGDEL, this is for the SP, so everything that was relevant about these packages in the CRAN um, database is now in JSON-LD format. Now this is JSON-LD format, that's not something that um, is part of uh, writing R projects, but having uh, information about the environment in that structured way allows you to do a number of things um, uh, with, uh, with the project. This is essentially the metadata that should be shipped with almost every research project. Again, this is another issue that many researchers face, uh, capturing metadata, how to capture it, how to automate that, how to pass it on in what format. That's one of the solutions. Um, and JSON, JSON-LD, these are two formats. I mean, this is 
extension. One is the base format, the other one is extension. Um, these are uh, pretty uh, popular and, and quite standard formats. So again, lots of tools that can deal with these formats. And finally, we have another file that um, Doctor generated for us, and that's the .docker file. I will again open it maybe here. So this is, this is the file that uh, is probably somewhat the most important at the moment because that file allows us to build the Docker image. And uh, as you can see, um, it was, it all, all we needed is just that one command, Docker compile. Yes, we needed to have Docker and Docker installed, but if I'm a researcher who is quite unfamiliar with Docker. I know a little bit about it, I've seen it. I, I kind of can spin a, a container that somebody, uh, with an image somebody gave to me, but how would I put it all um, in, how would I package my own work in a container that's uh, a little bit more complicated? All I had to do is install the tools and run one command, and I can also learn from this Docker file. So easy to, uh, to use, easy to throw away. It's not a black box. I can open and have a look inside. Now, um, we, uh, we have the standard information here that you would find in most Docker files. Um, as I said, we put in, so doc, doctor puts in uh, useful comments. So if you're somebody that would like to actually learn how to build your own Docker files and maintain them, um, these comments should be useful enough. And um, we said that, I, I, I said earlier that we uh, create Doctor to allow incremental builds. Um, so as you can see, we have the lines starting with run, and these are separate layers in a Docker file. So uh, what we do here, we separate what needs to be installed for the system, uh, what needs to be installed for, so here are the system packages that needs to be installed in extra uh, system repositories. Um, now, here we have system packages, uh, the requirements from the packages, language packages that need to be installed. These are the system packages. And now, finally, we have a line here with a common doctor. So this line is here put in by doctor so that what happens is um, from this point onwards, if I keep using Docker, if I want to now, which is going to be the next thing we're going to be doing, build an image using Docker um, or recompile that Docker file, Docker from now on will see if things have changed on the level of actual code. So instead of if I change the, um, the code, added some new packages, what Docker will do is not rebuild the whole image, but just look at the layers um, within the Docker file and say, okay, so probably we will have to do some work regarding the language packages from now onwards. So it allows to rebuild, recreate the image without having to do uh, quite a lot of um, time consuming uh, downloading and installing things that already are there and have not changed. So if we keep looking at our walkthrough. Hello, Dutch. Yep. I just point out to go back up to the system requirements, the, the actual packages, yeah, things like uh, um, libgdel dev and libproj dev, just those uh, apt packages that your R packages rely upon, relies upon, and which just from my own bitter experience, um, you know, often you have to discover those through trial and error of installing. You know, when you're writing a Docker file, you, you install your R packages and then it says, oh, you're missing these ones. And so I think that's one of the key advantages of this approach is because we fetch the metadata, um, those system packages, we know that they have to be inserted into the Docker file at that point in time. Yeah, I'm just going to bring up the screen. So. This is the RGDale. So this is information for RGDale um, package, the one that was included in our 
uh, our script. Uh, so this is where the information came from in, uh, that is included in the JSON file. And I'm just trying very quickly to, uh, yeah, so, so imports, so these are the, some of the dependencies. Yeah, well, this, this doesn't, look, just looking at this, so I think that's, that's the point. Just looking at this pretty comprehensive information about the package, it's still not enough to be sure that you're going to install everything that it requires. And um, actually, just insta installing RGDL doesn't guarantee that all the dependencies, system dependencies, will be installed. Um, so yeah, just like Dokumi was saying, you're gonna, you, you think you install there, so sometimes you install an R package and you see on the screen lots of things is getting pulled and then you try to run the code and it still says, and sometimes these messages are not uh, very user friendly, the messages about missing packages for many uh, researchers are quite hard to unpack and very frustrating to unpack. Uh, whilst they, again, the researcher wants to get the, the research done, wants to reproduce the plot that we did and try to change the data plot not for Philadelphia, maybe for Denver, but they can't because there is a missing package and they just can't reuse that code. And here's another, so related to that is another advantage of Doctor. So what we did in Doctor is that um, what is really good in managing packages for each language are the package managers. So our Python, as we will see in another example, they all have package managers, and that's what Doctor does. Doctor hands over installation of these packages to the uh, relevant package managers. So now we have the Docker file we should be able to build. So we type in Doctor build. And um, this, if you're following what I'm doing, it may take a little bit longer uh, for you. We have, we spent most of the morning trying out if everything works. So my, um, you will see that I already have built that image several times. So that's why it went much faster because what happened, doctor said, have you changed anything since the last build? Probably not. And it went very fast because most of the stuff that I need already is already on my machine. Yep. Oh, doc, it was Dr. Build. Sorry. It's here. Dr. Build. No, no, it's all, all valid questions. Dr. Build, yeah. Yeah, so if you're, if you're running, yeah, if you, if you type in Dr. Build, you yeah. still might be running, it still might be building the image. As I said, for me, I, I will have, you will see, I have um, a number of versions of this image and I built that image several times today because uh, we're trying out if everything works. And so um, you see the advantage. In your case, I know that may take two minutes depending on how, how fast the network is, what you only have on your machines. Um, for me, it took a few seconds, less than five seconds, I think. So imagine you as a researcher keep adding packages, changing packages, updating something, changing something with the data and just keep rebuilding that um, Docker container. Um, and it just becomes a lot of time where you just sit there and wait. Uh, and if you have a project or you got from someone uh, a large uh, a project that has a lot of packages and you just do small tweaks, if you only use Docker, so plain Docker, it, it will work, but it's gonna be taking more and more time. It's literally a time to go and have a cup of tea and come back which is nice, but if you do it several times a day and you really, really want to make that deadline, it becomes frustrating. I'll slowly be progressing through. Um, so now we will be able to see what Doctor did in terms of building the Im images. So um, I'm going to list all the images, Docker images that I have on my machine. So I'm actually using the Docker command here. So I'm looking at the images I have. So I have the R spatial latest and R spatial system. Now this is the layering that I mentioned earlier. So the R spatial system is sort of the, the base layer. So it, it has everything 
that I would need in terms of the system requirements, but the latest, the one with the tag latest, actually has, so the difference in sizes is tiny, but this will have the, all the things that are required in terms of the R packages beyond the system. Um, so if I actually would like to reproduce the research work that is um, in that R package, so create that plot with the uh, data from Philadelphia, I have to use the uh, image with the tag latest. Uh, that will work. If I use the image with the tag system, that will not work. It doesn't have these final uh, libraries, final, final elements of final packages uh, that are needed for reproducing the, um, the actual research work. So, okay, so yeah, we just went through that. So has, we have two tags, latest and system. And these are the incremental builds. Now, let's have a look and in into the layers. So I am taking the R spatial image and using the Docker command. So now I actually uh, reach out straight to Docker and I say, show me the history of what you were doing with the R spatial image. Okay. Let's make it easier to read. So here you will see, you probably don't have that many. I'm gonna put it on a maybe separate. I think it will be mm, Docker. So now you can see the difference. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to follow what we're doing, you, you don't have such long history. So this is uh, all information about the R spatial image uh, on my machine. And because, as you can see, I have been, I have been doing some work on it this morning and earlier this week and, um, uh, and actually sort of before lunch and you can see that there have been small changes. Now, this is, so all this should add up, these sizes should add up to that 1.0.5 gigabyte. But as you can see, those changes here are really, really small. And actually this is from, from this moment onwards, these are the um, the changes, the incremental changes that Doctor is doing. So instead of building the whole image from scratch, so these are the steps that are taken by, by Docker building the whole image layer by layer by layer. Um, from here onwards, this is done by Doctor. So Doctor is only looking at, okay, have you changed anything in the, just um, the, package language layers. So um, any, any other changes um, have, nothing else has changed. And the comments are put in here by doctor. Um, Nakami, would you be able to add something a bit more uh, elegantly explained than I just did? Yeah, I'm sure there's people that um, here that know how Docker works with these layered file systems. Maybe if you go back to the um, Docker file, be useful. Um, and so this common approach when you're using package managers like NPM or PIP or whatever is to take the approach that we're doing in the Docker file, which is to copy across, um, in this case, the description file, which describes the, the R packages that we're using. Now, if you were just using Docker, then if you added a package to that description file and copied it across, then all the layers, Docker would throw away all the layers below that and reinstall all the packages that you already had. Um, 
And so what we're doing here is, is instead, of, instead of throwing away all the lowers, layers below that line 44, um, we're essentially reusing those layers. So we're re-executing that run bash command within that same layer. And so that, that R script, which does the installation or your pip or your NPM, depending on what package manager you use, um, it takes over there and says, well, you've already got these packages installed, so I don't need to do that. I'll just um, upgrade or add these other packages. So it's uh, it's coming. It's re it's really reusing layers um, at that layer. So incremental builds, and uh, there are some other tools that do this. Like I think the Red Hat um, tool that is Open OpenShift or something, Richard, um, does a similar sort of approach. Thank you. Okay, so we, we had a look at the history of that image, what was going on with that image. If you, if you managed to follow, if you're managing to follow, you, you didn't have that long history, you just had just, just newly created the system and the latest image um, with, um, with a new history. Now, let's see that incremental build that we just discussed in detail, uh, how it works in practice. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to add a, uh, uh, another library into the main R package, sorry, main R code. So now as you can see, there is this library for cuts here at the bottom. Uh, in case of R code, it doesn't matter. Uh, obviously, it would be nicer to open um, the script and put it at the top, but uh, we just have a, a, a walkthrough in a format of that script, so we just use append at the end, but for R it doesn't matter, um, the, the, uh, the packages, uh, the libraries can be uh, loaded uh, below as long as they're available before they're used, made available before they're used. Now, um, we will require this new library, so let's see what Doctor will be able to do with this. So again, I use Doctor compile, um, so Doctor has now uh, an, extra, an extra task has to uh, reanalyze the code. So remember, we still have the dot description, dot docker file, dot JSON uh, environment, JSON file, uh, files, but Doctor has to now see if nothing's changed. So if we look at the description file now, dot description. So again, I mentioned earlier, if you don't want um, doctor to uh, keep using the code, source code, if I, if I had a description file without the dot, doctor would actually look inside the description file because it has to kind of check either or. Um, but we didn't change that name, so doctor said okay. So this is a file I actually generated. So I'd better check if there's nothing else, nothing new in the code. And as you can see, that new library is now added by Doctor. And the same thing in Docker files. So, um, well, actually, in Docker file, that won't be that immediately visible because I think that Forecuts doesn't require any extra stuff in terms of the system, but the magic happens here. So um, remember the dot description file changed, it's being copied over, and now our package manager will go, okay, in description, what do I need? I need those three libraries. So RG, Dale, Forecuts, and SP. So if you rebuild the image now, again, and if you are following now, this build should take significantly less time, okay? Because what happens is it's incremental build. So um, doctor um, checks that everything below the, the layer of putting the language packages hasn't changed, so all it needs to do is added uh, one package using the R package manager. So if we look at the history again, I will I'll run it here, but it's not that well. 
Well, we see that there has been an image that created 33 seconds ago versus those 12 minutes ago. And again, the, the size here is tiny. It's just because we added those four cuts, that four cuts package um, on the top of what was already in the image. So let's see if we actually can execute the R code. So can we create the, um, the plot that um, whoever published the paper or sent us the, uh, the code with the, um, with the um, uh, image? Uh, can, can we reproduce that or test if we can reproduce before we uh, make this image, the Docker image available? So uh, the command docker execute actually does three things in one. So it will do behind the scenes compile, build, and then spin the container and uh, run uh, the code within the container. Um, that is kind of a, um, having those three steps in one makes sure that if something changed uh, in the meantime, docker will make this, include these updates. So if we actually in the meantime made some changes and forgot to do compile and build, Doctor will take care of it. Oh really, is that the first build you're, oh, that maybe that might be the network as well, sorry about this. So we should have the, Okay, we have the plot available. So yeah, that's the plot that is created by this code. Okay, so the code is fairly short, but one of the main things is that it uses the right uh, packages, our packages to create it, and these packages are not trivial to install. So we have the plot. Now, um, another problem that is, again, proliferating across research is giving the credit. Um, obviously, if somebody authors the paper, they are put there as the author and other co-authors. But um, as you can see, the output of, of research is uh, thanks to a number of people that contributed to the software. Software often data collection, but in our case we are looking particularly on the software. So uh, what if you'd like to credit, you actually should credit as a researcher, everyone that helped you achieve your result, in this case the authors of the software that you used. So we have a command called Doctor Who, and that command looks through the information that is actually already available in the environment.json-ld and lists the authors of all the packages that are used in the project with, so it's, an, it's the name of a, each person plus in the uh, brackets you can see um, the packages that they contributed to out of the packages that you're using. Um, now, uh, I said we're gonna also use Another example with Python code, so let's try and do that. <coughs> um, so if you could navigate to the second uh, directory that, is within, that was within that zip uh, called pi-weather, and this one has two files, one do, uh, called main.py and one called requirements. Oh, I have a typo, it's not easy to pick up, it's easy to pick up, easy to throw away. Um, so um, let's, let's see in practice how it works. We have the requirements file. Um, oh, it has the requirements now because, sorry, because I created it, so I will delete that. So the and I'll actually delete everything I shouldn't have there so that I have exactly what you have. This is all the results of um, us trying things. Uh, 
Um, I have to refresh the tree view. Did I accidentally delete the folder? Um, hopefully not. Oh yeah, I deleted this. Okay. So let's just unstage that. And we should be good to go. Maybe refresh it now. Oh refresh now, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. So now I should, I have what I should have had before. So just the main.py file rather than requirements, sorry. Um, so I actually shouldn't have the requirements file. Had I had the requirements file, this is what Doctor would be using to build the image. But again, we are not creating this file, we're not maintaining it. It's a file that um, a lot of researchers will create in their project. But most of the researchers, or many researchers, at least in my experience, don't create um, the requirements.txt file. They just have um, the Py, Python code in the .py um, uh, uh, files um, organized in a different way. Uh, some researchers don't really have uh, code very well modularized, so they're just going to have one big file with a lot of code. Um, now, Doctor will create the requirements file for us. So I will run Docker compile, Docker compile. I have to refresh that again. Okay. See them here. Hmm. Yeah, but I, I can I should be able to see the dot ones in the uh, in the tree folder. Okay, let's let, rely on what we can see in the terminal then. So I actually can see um, these three files. Similarly to the previous example, but instead of the description file, I have the requirements of text, dot requirements of text. So if I look inside the file, I see that we have matplotlib and pandas. These are the two uh, files that are actually required um, by the project. So I should be able to see in the code. Now, as you can see that there are several uh, more uh, packages that are at the top of the Python file. And the reason why they're not listed in the requirements is that uh, and some of these files are um, coming with the standard um, installation. So they're going to be available within Python or they might be also part of the dependencies of uh, the packages such as Matplotlib or Pandas, essentially what doctor does is does an intelligent way of uh, putting the uh, information in the requirements file. So if, there, if it knows that there is something that depends on what's going to be put in the requirements file, it's going to put the top uh, sort of the, the, the file that will actually pull that uh, other dependencies of if something is already included in the standard installation, it's not going to put it in the requirements file. So again, a bit of an advantage over manually updating that file um, for a for a human, um, either you know it or you have to check it, or if you don't know it, uh, there is a bit of a redundancy, which is not a big problem, uh, but as the number of your packages grows, it just makes it easier to read, easier to um, 
clearer to understand. So if we want to be now in charge, we can rename the dot requirements dot text to requirements dot text without a dot preceding it. If we do that, um, it means that uh, uh, that what's going to be happening from now onwards, doctor will look only at the requirements file. It won't be looking into the code. So the assumption is that if a user has a requirements file or a description file like it was with uh, the R project, it updates, the user is responsible for updating it and the doctor will rely on these uh, meta information rather than on the code. So we're just gonna do that. So we're gonna rename these files and now we are the ones who are maintaining these files. So we add um, another uh, package, uh, date utilities, the requirements file. So we have Matplotlib pandas and Python minus date utilities, date util package. So we're growing our code, we need that package. Now, if we tell doctor to build an image, so compile and build, so these are actually two steps in one, doctor will look into the requirements text file. So I didn't change the code, the code, the code sorry, is as it was, so it actually does not include this package here, so doctor, uh, is smart enough, well smart enough, it assumes that, okay, if you want any packages, you will put them here for into requirements. So they will be here. So I'm not gonna be looking at the code. Again, for me, this build should be relatively faster, not as fast as they are. Although I just, built just before starting the tutorial, so not much has changed, I think. This looks like it's beginning uh, building from the start. It's not, using, it's not using any caching. Okay. It wasn't even listed on the Docker file list. No, that's why. Oh yeah, okay. So yeah, okay, if, whilst it's building, you can imagine that if uh, we had everything in one layer, which is um, recommended for, uh, often recommended for um, having images for containers, but in the particular, in this particular case, case some, maybe some other cases, but if you're a researcher and you keep adding packages and having to rebuild the image um, and rerun the image, doing this every time, is pretty time consuming. And it's not unusual to keep adding changing packages, uh, changing the versions. At this point here, it's building a system layer up before that doctor com uh, com special comment. And what we should have probably done is built this before, before we added the Py, Python date utils, um, just to show how that incremental build word works better. Um, the strange thing is, you know, I ran it just before, and it, I think it built. I didn't right. look like it didn't. But. Yeah, so this is where, oh no, sorry, I was gonna say this is pip, but it's not. So that's, just, that's the system bit, and then here, pip's doing its work 
So it's looking at the requirements file and installing at plot 11, all the other ones. Yeah, so it's fetching pandas here. Yeah. Uh, data utilities, matplotlib. Well, um, matplotlib from NumPy. If you were to go now just into a separate um, terminal window, just to... Yeah, I'll just get that up. I don't know why it's not showing in there. Now, if you go back to the editor and just in the requirements file, just put a comment, like a, a hash comment or something. Um, so where's that file? <laughs> oh, ls. Oh, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's hidden, okay. Oh, no, actually, it shouldn't be because you... Oh, uh, yeah, because I renamed it. There's something strange. I think it's because you deleted that fault folder, so I think you're actually in the trash. Oh, OK. Oh, OK, but I I restored it before I run to... Um, OK, so what did Visual Studio... Um, probably doesn't matter. You're probably better off just keeping on going through the wall. Yeah, sorry, I... I don't know where we have the... Hmm. Oh well, we're just going to carry on with displaying it here with cat commands, I think. Yeah, so we have the pi weather latest in system, just like with the spatial. And, well, the reason why the size is so huge is because I think it pulls matplotlib and pandas and like NumPy and all the dependencies that are required for these, these libraries are actually really large. So that's, I think that's also part of the reason why yeah. the latest is so, so big. Yeah, um, I don't, yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> We can't see the requirements file. The, oh, the Docker file that build it. Um, Maybe just get out of the demo and we can go and yeah. you can do that manually. Um, okay. So. If you CD into that directory. Tests. And, and then Dr. Compile it um, oh, yeah, to, okay. to create the requirements file. Uh, yeah. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we have Matlib and Pandas. So now do the same steps, so is that what you mean? Yeah, I was just going to show that when now, maybe just now do a doc, doctor build here, and it should be pretty quick because we've got the layers. Um, and everything's at rear. So now if you were just to go into um, doctor, uh, Docker file. No, uh, you want to rename the dot requirements to requirements okay. as you did before. So we've just seen pip go and install the necessary packages in that layer. That's right, and then and then add your. Um, yeah, so that just opened. So that I don't put something in again, I shouldn't. Not 
3.7.5, I think. So we're rebuilding with Doctor. All right, so a whole lot of things already satisfied, and then it should have installed by utils. Uh, yeah, so it's. But it's all, yeah, it's yeah. already. Right, right. Done because, it. because you did it earlier yeah, on. Because yeah, because I did it in the. Yeah. But the now end. I was just going to say, like, put in that requirements file, you can put, for instance, a, um, a just a comment, just to put a hash and foo, whatever. Um, and do it again, do the doctor build again. So ah. You're just changing the file just irrelevantly, and if you do the doctor build, um, it should be fast again. Yeah, but now if you do docker build and... Um, so I'm typing in docker build. Yeah, yep. and, and docker build dash f uh, dot docker file and do that then um, when you build that it should run oh you want after after build want a dot for the current directory. oh yeah the current directory okay yeah so here um, because the requirements file has changed, it's um, seeing that as it can't use the cache. So Docker's going through and it says, oh, I can use the cache. But because the requirements file has changed, um, with that comment, it's reinstalling everything again. So um, it's just an example of just a different approach that we're taking from what Docker does. Instead of throwing everything out below the requirements file, all the layers out. Um, we're reusing that layer and letting PIP manage that at that level. Yeah, so it's, yeah. Right. So oh. if, you, if you do the same command again now, it'll be really quick. So that was really done, but then if you like remove the comment, it'll, um, it'll reinstall everything again. So even though it's a, just a comment, It'll say, well, that requirements file has changed. I'm going to throw out all these packages that you installed. <laughs> no, it hasn't. No, it's not that stupid. <laughs> um, did you save it? Um, yeah, I did save it, yeah. Huh. Let's, let's see. I got probably proven wrong. It, it is that stupid. Okay, so I just added a comment. Oh, yeah, oh. that was cached. Yep, you changed it, so it's different. Yep, so run that now. It's proven me wrong. It's funny. Oh, and it's, yeah, but uh, uh, but we could add. Oh no! You know, see what it's doing? It's copying the dot requirements. Requirements. Okay. okay. Copy dot requirements to requirements. Okay. Is, that, is there a dot requirements in that folder? It shouldn't be. No. Mm -mm. So it should get it. Oh, using cache. So that is doing something here. Yeah, we'd from have, a we'd, from we'd, a previous we'd, image. We'd have to manually edit the doc, Docker file to do this. Yeah, it's doing something here from the. So that must be from the previous image where we actually had the. Yeah, where we had the dot requirements. requirements of, yeah. Okay. So um, that's a bit weird that it's working still, but if you go into the doc, dot Docker file and were to edit that, then this would work. Um, so instead yeah. of copying the dot requirements file, copy the requirements file over. Here. Yep. And then. Okay. A silly comment in there. Yeah. Okay. And so we run the Docker build again. Oh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that wasn't that was, wasn't a very yeah. good demonstration of the fact that, that that you just need to even just put a space or something or change the version number and everything gets reinstalled um, when you're taking that approach of copying the requirements files across.
that's a little bit, well, I mean, it is faster than doing it from scratch, but still unnecessarily longer. Just downloading um, the packages that are already there. And if they're big, so matplotlib, uh, pandas, as you saw, these are big packages that uh, system, uh, not system, sorry, um, latest image, image labeled with latest, so the application sort of layer was 400 or 600 megabytes, so quite large. So one thing which we weren't sure if, uh, how do I get the slide to unhide? You're in draft mode anyway, so it's all being shown. Oh yeah, okay, true. So that the kind of next steps is something which um, we uh, are thinking of, and it's actually the work has already started, is to create a, um, tool that um, builds on top of Docker and Nix, and maybe Nakami could say a few more or more words about that. Yeah, so we we've been interested in this approach of using um, JSON LD and collecting the metadata for projects and being having this representation of a project's compute environment and building that up from source code and. Um, Really, our, our longer work plan doesn't stop at using Docker for that. Um, Docker's great, but there are a number of issues with that, and part of that is these huge image sizes. If you've seen the Docker images for a Python project uh, and, or an R project can easily get over a, um, a gigabyte, and two or three gigabytes is not unusual. And so if you're building one of those for each individual project you're working on, it gets pretty big pretty quickly. Um, so Nix is a package manager um, that has its own um, dependency system. So for each Nix package, um, you define the things that it depends upon. Um, and it's really powerful, but not very user friendly. And um, But we think there's a lot of potential in trying to make that more accessible. Um, in scientific computing, things like Conda and Anaconda are really um, popular. And um, they have their own binary packages, but Nix provides something like 30, 40,000 different packages. And so we're working on a tool as a sister project to Doctor that will share a bunch of the code, but um, which is using Nix. So that's the sort of thing that we're working on um, currently. Yeah. OK. Um, do we have any questions or any comments? Yeah, I think. So you mean that it is reproducible, but it depends on um, the information about the packages that we. So or, or we move yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's true. But so, but once you've built the image, you've got it on your drive, and you can then export that as a, a huge TAR file. So you, you can archive it and make it available like that. Yeah. More questions or more comments? Right. 
Thank you very much.